Wizard is a translation of Quenya Istar, Sindarin Ithron, one of the members of an order, as they called it, claiming to possess and exhibiting eminent knowledge of the history and nature of the world. The translation, though suitable in its relation to wise and other ancient words of knowing, similar to that of Istar in Quenya, is not perhaps happy, since the Heren Istarion, or Order of Wizards, was quite distinct from the wizards and magicians of later legend. They belonged solely to the Third Age and then departed, and none save maybe Elrond, Círdan, and Galadriel discovered of what kind they were or whence they came. Among men, they were supposed at first by those that had dealings with them to be men who had acquired law and arts by long and secret study. They first appeared in Middle-earth about the year 1000 of the Third Age, but for long they went about in simple guise, as it were, of men already old in years but hale in body, travellers and wanderers, gaining knowledge of Middle-earth and all that dwelt therein, but revealing to none their powers and purposes. In that time men saw them seldom and heeded them little. But as the shadow of Sauron began to grow and take shape again, they became more active and sought ever to contest the growth of the shadow, and to move elves and men to beware of their peril. Then far and wide rumour of their comings and goings, and their meddling in many matters, was noised among men. And men perceived that they did not die, but remained the same, unless it were that they aged somewhat in looks, while the fathers and sons of men passed away. Men therefore grew to fear them, even when they loved them, and they were held to be of the elven race, with whom indeed they often consorted. Yet they were not so, for they came from over the sea out of the uttermost west, though this was for long known only to Círdan, guardian of the Third Ring, master of the Grey Havens, who saw their landings upon the western shores. Emissaries they were from the lords of the West, the Valar, who still took counsel for the governance of Middle-earth, and when the shadow of Sauron began first to stir again, took this means of resisting him. For with the consent of Eru they sent members of their own high order, but clad in bodies as of men, real and not feigned, but subject to the fears and pains and weariness of earth able to hunger and thirst and be slain, though because of their noble spirits they did not die, and aged only by the cares and labours of many long years. Who would go? For they must be mighty, peers of Sauron, but must forego might and clothe themselves in flesh so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men. But this would imperil them, dimming their wisdom and knowledge, and confusing them with fears, cares, and wearinesses coming from the flesh. But two only came forward, Kurumo, who was chosen by Aule, and Alatar, who was sent by Orome. Then Manwe asked, Where was Olorin? And Olorin, who was clad in grey, and having just entered from a journey, had seated himself at the edge of the council, asked what Manwe would have of him. Manwe replied that he wished Olorin to go as the third messenger to Middle-earth. But Olorin declared that he was too weak for such a task, and that he feared Sauron. Then Manwe said that that was all the more reason why he should go, and that he commanded Olorin. But at that, Varda looked up and said, Not as the third. And Kurumo took Iwendil because Yavanda begged him, and that Alatar took Palando as a friend. And this the Valar did, desiring to amend the errors of old, especially that they had attempted to guard and seclude the Eldar by their own might and glory fully revealed, whereas now their emissaries were forbidden to reveal themselves in forms of majesty, or to seek to rule the wills of men or elves by open display of power. But coming in shapes weak and humble, were bidden to advise and persuade men and elves to good, 
and to seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron, should he come again, would endeavor to dominate and corrupt. The first to come was one of noble mien and bearing, with raven hair and a fair voice, and he was clad in white. Great skill he had in works of hand, and he was regarded by well nigh all, even by the Eldar, as the head of the order. Others there were also, two clad in sea blue and one in earthen brown, and last came one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and in looks more aged, grey-haired and grey-clad, and leaning on a staff. But Círdan, from their first meeting at the Grey Havens, divined in him the greatest spirit and the wisest, and he welcomed him with reverence, and he gave to his keeping the third ring, Narya the Red. For, said he, great labors and perils lie before you, and lest your task prove too great and wearisome, take this ring for your aid and comfort. It was entrusted to me only to keep secret, and here upon the west shores it is idle. But I deem that in days ere long to come it should be in nobler hands than mine, that may wield it for the kindling of all hearts to courage. And the grey messenger took the ring, and kept it ever secret. Yet the white messenger, who was skilled to uncover all secrets, after a time became aware of this gift, and begrudged it, and it was the beginning of the hidden ill will that he bore to the grey, which afterwards became manifest. Now these Maya were sent by the Valar at a crucial moment in the history of Middle-earth to enhance the resistance of the elves of the West waning in power and of the uncorrupted men of the West greatly outnumbered by those of the East and South. It may be seen that they were free each to do what they could in this mission, that they were not commanded or supposed to act together as a small central body of power and wisdom, and that each had different powers and inclinations, and were chosen by the Valar with this in mind. Now the white messenger in later days became known among elves as Kurunir, the man of craft, in the tongues of northern men, Saruman. But that was after he returned from his many journeys, and came into the realm of Gondor, and there abode. Of the blue little was known in the west, and they had no names save Ithrin Luin, the blue wizards, for they passed into the east with Kurunir, but they never returned, and whether they remained in the east, pursuing there the purposes for which they were sent, or perished, or as some hold were ensnared by Sauron and became his servants, is not now known. But none of these chances were impossible to be, for strange indeed though this may seem, the Istari, being clad in bodies of Middle-earth, might, even as men and elves, fall away from their purposes and do evil, forgetting the good in the search for power to effect it. For it is said indeed that being embodied, the Istari had need to learn much anew by slow experience, and though they knew whence they came, the memory of the blessed realm was to them a vision from afar off, for which, so long as they remained true to their mission, they yearned exceedingly. Thus by enduring of free will the pangs of exile and the deceits of Sauron, they might redress the evils of that time. Indeed of all the Astari only one remained faithful, and he was the last comer. For Radagast, the fourth, became enamoured of the many beasts and birds that dwelt in Middle-earth, and forsook elves and men, and spent his days among the wild creatures. Thus he got his name, which is in the tongue of Numenor of old, and signifies, it is said, tender of beasts. And Kurunir Lan, Saruman the White, fell from his high errand, and becoming proud and impatient and enamoured of power, sought to have his own will by force, 
and to oust Sauron. But he was ensnared by that dark spirit, mightier than he. But the last comer was named among the elves Mithrandir, the Grey Pilgrim, for he dwelt in no place, and gathered to himself neither wealth nor followers, but ever went to and fro in the westlands from Gondor to Angmar, and from Linden to Lorien, befriending all folk in times of need. Warm and eager was his spirit, and it was enhanced by the ring Narya, for he was the enemy of Sauron, opposing the fire that devours and wastes with the fire that kindles, and suckers in one hope and distress. But his joy and his swift wrath were veiled in garments grey as ash, so that only those that knew him well glimpsed the flame that was within. Merry he could be, and kindly to the young and simple, and yet quick at times to sharp speech and the rebuking of folly. But he was not proud, and sought neither power nor praise, and thus far and wide he was beloved among all those that were not themselves proud. Mostly he journeyed unwearyingly on foot, leaning on a staff, and so he was called among men of the north Gandalf, the elf of the wand, for they deemed him, though in error as has been said, to be of elven kind, since he would at times work wonders among them, loving especially the beauty of fire, and yet such marvels he wrought mostly for mirth and delight, and desired not that any should hold him in awe or take his counsels out of fear. Elsewhere it is told how it was that when Sauron rose again, he also arose, and partly revealed his power, and becoming the chief mover of the resistance to Sauron, was at last victorious, and brought all by vigilance and labour to that end which the Valar under the one that is above them had designed. Yet it is said that in the ending of the task for which he came, he suffered greatly and was slain, and being sent back from death for a brief while, was clothed then in white, and became a radiant flame, yet veiled still, save in great need. And when all was over, and the shadow of Sauron was removed, he departed forever over the sea, whereas Kurunir was cast down and utterly humbled, and perished at last by the hand of an oppressed slave. And his spirit went whithersoever it was doomed to go, and to Middle-earth, whether naked or embodied, came never back. Who was Gandalf? It is said that in later days, when again a shadow of evil arose in the kingdom, it was believed by many of the faithful of that time that Gandalf was the last appearance of Manwe himself, before his final withdrawal to the watchtower of Teniquitil. That Gandalf said that his name in the West had been Olorin was, according to this belief, the adoption of an incognito, a mere by name. I do not, of course, know the truth of the matter, and if I did, it would be a mistake to be more explicit than Gandalf was but I think it was not so. Manwe will not descend from the mountain until the Dagor Dagorath and the coming of the end, when Melkor returns. To the overthrow of Morgoth he sent his herald Aonwe. To the defeat of Sauron would he not then send some lesser but mighty spirit of the angelic people, one coeval and equal doubtless with Sauron in their beginnings, but not more? Olorin was his name. But of Olorin we shall never know more than he revealed in Gandalf.